Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the, the seventh lecture, uh, first of the second semester in the series on medieval Armenian poetry. Um, I have really enjoyed uh, preparing this series. Uh, a lot of the material is new for me, and so um, I'm learning as much as, as I hope you are just in preparing uh, these lectures. And um, this lecture tonight, I've entitled Middle Armenian and the Turn Towards a Literary Vernacular. And so we'll get into that in just a minute. But first, I just want to spend a couple minutes recalling all that we covered already last semester uh, in the six lectures. If you remember, in the very beginning, we set up this contrast between the new literary language invented by monks, Masrot Mashtots and his circle of followers, uh, who wrote largely in prose and base their writings mostly on uh, genres from Western uh, languages, so Greek and Syriac. And there was still the oral poetic tradition uh, performed by the Gusans, which stretched back to pre-Christian uh, oral traditions, including pagan uh, literature and just kind of uh, songs celebrating, uh, wine drinking, love, etc. And these were performed at royal courts and at festive gatherings like weddings uh, and other ceremonial gatherings. Um, so it took a while for the Christian writers to feel that it was okay to write in verse, uh, because verse and poetry was associated with that Gusan tradition. So we saw it first started to happen in the form of the shadagons and other sacred musical genres uh, developed in different places, and then especially at the monastery of Nadeg. Um, we also looked at the penitential poetry, um, how Nadeg and his followers capitalized on the ability of poetry to affect the emotions of the human being and instill the right kind of emotional response that they wanted uh, one to have when praying before God. Um, then we looked at this genre of biblical epic, which was started by Grigor Magistros in his confrontation, remember with the Persian uh, scholar in the capital of Constantinople arguing over um, you know, the supremacy of the Quran um, because it's in such beautiful verse over the Christian scriptures, which in the Islamic view are kind of a hodgepodge of, you know, different writers from different centuries thrown together. And so Grigor Magistros writes this, puts the contents of the scriptures into epic verse and even borrows the Islamic uh, verse pattern, rhyme pattern ending in E, uh, the Kafa, in order to compose uh, his work. And this was picked up and followed by Nersa Shnorhali and later by other writers such as Arakal of Sunik. Uh, then we also looked at laments for the fall of cities. So again, um, here's a calamitous event which starts to happen again and again in places where Armenians lived. The first one was written by Nersa Shnorhali on the fall of Edessa, but you have later ones written over the fall of Constantinople, Jerusalem, uh, and other places. And again, because it's meant to work on the emotions of the reader, you choose poetry as the most appropriate genre or form in order to compose a work like this. And this is kind of where we left it. So poetry in the hands uh, now of the clerical elite, who's making use of its, its power and potency in order to get across the messages that they want. And um, things are going to start to shift a little bit in this half of the semester, where we'll see that um, poetry is 
is getting closer to the, it's kind of um, getting a little bit out of the elitist kind of high clerical monastic sphere and getting closer to the people. And one of the major ways that happens is in the very language in which the poetry is composed. So instead of imitating the high classical Kurapar standard uh, of the fifth century, which we see even figures like Grigor Magistros, Nersa Shnodhali doing um, in this period, we start to see texts appearing in a form of the language called Middle Armenian, Michin Hayarem, which is essentially um, based on the vernacular that people were speaking of the time uh, and just written. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the features of Middle Armenian, in part because it's very interesting and some of us you know, I've studied classical Armenian, a lot of us know modern Armenian, and you can see it as kind of in between the two. Um, but also because I don't actually know any good work in English that talks about um, the grammatical features of Middle Armenian, how it develops from Kurapar and then kind of transitions into modern Armenian. Um, these three are, these are some of the sources that are most cited and and that I've found most helpful on Middle Armenian. There's a, a grammar written in German in 1901 by Josef Karst. It's very long and extensive and descriptive. Um, Marc Nishanian wrote a book called, in French, Age et Usage de la Langue Armenienne. This is like a narrative history of the Armenian language and literature from, you know, the fifth century to the present. And along the way, he also gives descriptions of the way the language is changing uh, due to influence and contact and interchange with other uh, languages and just the natural way that language changes over uh, from one generation to another. And then pro probably the best um, description or, or one of the best is the Mahitra's father, Arsen Aydanyan, who wrote a a critical grammar of modern Armenian in the mid 19th century. And in this very long work, so right as Western Armenian is kind of being standardized as a language, in this very long work, there's a 350 or so page introduction that gives a history of the Armenian language and the grammatical and phonetic changes that happened over time. And um, Mark Nashanian, for example, based a lot of his description off of that uh, grammar of Arsene Aydanian and the, the historical work he did to show the way the language changed over time. Um, these three categories, we could say Karapar or Classical Armenian, Michin Aydan, Middle Armenian, Ashkarapar, Lay or Vernacular Armenian, um, they're very fluid. We don't want to think of them as, you know, three strict categories, but they're they're kind of on a continuum and even represent like different streams at the same time. So for example, Nersa Shnodali wrote several poetic and all of his prose works in classical Armenian, following the standard grammar and norms set back in the fifth century. But as we'll see later in this lecture, he also wrote in Middle Armenian. And he was one of the first writers to do so. Uh, so writers could choose which level they wanted to reach in, and it would depend on what kind of text they're writing. If you're writing a biblical commentary or some kind of theological work, you're going to choose the classical uh, language because that's what all these works in the tradition are written in. But as we'll see, when he came to write his riddles and proverbs, he chose the the vernacular literary of the time, and because he was trying to reach the widest audience possible. Um, so Kurapar, um, in around the 10th, 11th, 12th century, it stops being immediately comprehensible uh, to Armenian speakers. It's a language you have to learn and study in order to be able to understand. 
because by that 600, 700 year time span, the spoken language, which is always changing, had grown so far apart from the classical of the fifth century that you needed some education in order to be able to understand it. Um, so Middle Armenian, however, which starts around the 11th or 12th century, never gets standardized, so to, so to speak, in the way that classical Armenian does, and even that modern Armenian does in the 19th century. Middle Armenian is basically a catch-all term used for um, mostly poetry, uh, but also some medical and legal works written between the 12th to 17th, 18th century. And each writer who writes in it um, introduces their own idiosyncrasies based on their own spoken dialect. So there, uh, there really is no like standard Middle Armenian that everyone is aspiring to. You really should just think of it as like people putting their spoken language into written form and um, adopting some uh, grammatical regularity, uh, uh, even adopting some kudapar forms in order uh, to, to make it more readily understandable to others maybe who don't speak the exact same dialect uh, as you do. And then, um, this is beyond what we're doing here, but uh, as many of you know, of course, in the 19th century is when the spoken vernacular uh, or vernaculars become standardized into a uh, kind of standard written language. And this is a process that takes a lot of time. And um, there's both the Eastern uh, written standard developing based on uh, dialects and scholars around Tbilisi and Yerevan, and then the Western literary standard uh, developing by, by people based in Bolis mostly. And by the late 19th century, these are pretty much uh, uh, standardized and regularized. Okay, so, so let's look a little bit at some of the features that mark out Middle Armenian. And again, these are just kind of generalizations because everyone also has their idiosyncratic ways. So there's some major changes to the verbal system. Um, on the top row, you can see the present in classical Armenian, dom, I give. The aorist, yedu, I gave to someone else, or yed, he gave. And the future dots, I will give, or subjunctive dots. Um, um, so it says here, C-I-L, which is like Kilikian Armenian, because this kind of really uh, develops first in Kilikian Armenia, the kingdom of Cilicia. And what is most notable is the introduction of gu, this particle gu, which is put to the front of the verbs and really, it kind of starts out as an emphasis. And you see that in, in what it's derived from. So a lot of, you'll hear a lot of times people say things like, um, Gu is, is Turkish, or it isn't real Armenian, or it's not standard Armenian or something. It's absolutely native Armenian. And it's developed from native Armenian words, ga, u. And um, these kind of get blended together into gu, and it becomes like an emphasis, like I do give. But then it kind of just becomes regularized and is just basic I, I give, and it's attached to all uh, verbs. But for a while, it's, it's kind of optional whether you put it in there or not with the present. Um, then the past changes to divi. Uh, for, for this verb and, and, and a lot of other verbs. Um, and the future also changes. It becomes like a compound. So gamim dal, like I wish to give, or I shall, I will give. Even that's how English forms the future. I will give you something. Um, so you can see SWA, standard Western Armenian, uh, how similar the Middle Armenian forms are to what becomes standard in modern Armenian. 
Um, then um, another characteristic feature that makes its way into the modern spoken language, especially, is this particle ne, which in the earlier period is na, and it is also a native Armenian uh, word, and it's used in a variety of different contexts, just like in the spoken language today. It's kind of used several different ways, but one of the most prominent ways is it means then, used in a conditional, like if you do this, then I'll do that. And it's still used like that in modern spoken Armenian. So for example, yete usut tsenem, if I teach, na gusis, then you'll learn. And this is very similar to what it would be in modern Armenian today, like yete usut tsenem ne gusis or gusorvis. Um, just the na is usually ne in modern. Um, but again, this is a natural development in Armenian through the spoken language that then in Middle Armenian starts to be written. Um, there's a lot of sound changes and phonetic changes. And one of uh, the prominent ones is the loss of diphthongs in a number of places. So like double vowels get simplified into single vowels. So instead of classical yur for like he or his, you get ir, which it is in modern Armenian today. Instead of ui, in a lot of places, you get u. So you used to have anuish, now it's anush. Uish for force or strength, uj, uh, which is more common in modern Armenian today. Ya gets simplified to ye. So siav was black, now sev. And it continues like that into modern Armenian. Um, we all know this, the au becomes o, and you get the new letter o written at this time. Uh, so for aur, or, for day. I, in a lot of places, gets pronounced e. So hair, father, is pronounced her. And still in many spoken dialects, it's pronounced her today, although in the standard written modern Armenian, you, you put hair. Um, and then you get a lot of changes, just like you had changes in verbs, verb declensions, you get a lot of changes, or verb conjugation, you get a lot of changes in noun declensions. And um, there's also uh, a lot of uh, nouns kind of being declined in different ways than they were in classical. Um, but then there's also some kind of systematic changes across the board. And one of these is the plural. So you still see the normal K plural showing up in Middle Armenian texts, but now you can also make plurals a different way, which is by adding er or ner. And this is the way plurals plural nouns are made in modern Armenian. Um, you also get kind of confusion between the accusative and nominative plural. So the accusative plural se or nominative plural k, uh, sometimes they get mixed up and you can find one or the other and uh, you just know what it is based on the context. And these, for all of these categories, I'm just giving a few examples, but there's there's lots more, just to give you kind of a sense of it. Um, one of the other major things is you get a lot of new words. And some of the words, like the first four here, are Armenian words that I guess come from different dialects that never had been in the standard classical Armenian, but they were uh, words spoken in different dialects, now they get written at this time, and then they uh, persist as part of the written language. So areg is one of them, uh, meaning well. Kesh, meaning bad. So these are two of the most common words in uh, modern Armenian today. They enter at the, into the written language at this time. 
Alvor, pretty or nice. Urish, for another. Um, these next two words are examples of borrowings that come from French during uh, the Silesian Crusader period. There's a whole lot of words like this. Not all of them last in uh, across time. Some are just kind of used in that period and then kind of drop away. But others last, uh, like Baron is still used uh, today, although with a slightly different meaning. Uh, prince for prince <laughs> is used in this period. Um, and, and Persis for uh, several centuries. And then you also get borrowings from Arabic, Persian, and Turkish. And a lot of words uh, come in at this time, depending on uh, the person writing. But into the spoken language, we can assume, and, and it just makes sense that more and more and more, these kind of words are being used as Armenians, uh, Turkish speakers, Persian speakers, Arabic speakers are all living together and kind of sharing words together. So surat, coming from Arabic, uh, is used in Middle, Middle Armenian poetry. Nachshem, surat means uh, face. Nachshem, meaning I paint, is used um, again from an Arabic root. So again, these are just examples. There's hundreds of such words um, like this, and, and we'll probably see some in some material later. Okay, so let's look at this uh, really interesting quote, which comes from Mechitar Heratsi. So this is one of the very first texts written in Middle Armenian. Mechitar Heratsi lived in the 12th century, and he wrote a book called Mechitar Utun Chermans, which is a medical work about cures for fevers. And he, unlike the, you know, clerical figures writing in this, uh, you know, long monastic theological tradition, um, he's trying to write a text that's going to be helpful and useful to common people for practical everyday needs. And so he says in the introduction to that book, Yev Arari Issa Kechchub, sorry, it's misspelled, it should be with again at the end. Yev Arari Issa Kechchub Yev Artsag Parparov, Zi Tura Haslitsi Amenain Anterzogats. So I composed or made this book in the vulgar and free language so that it would be easily comprehensible for all readers. So he's saying clearly at the outset, I'm making a choice, I'm choosing to write in a way that's closer to how people speak so that everyone can understand this. Um, also at this time, Mukhitar Ghosh, uh, composes his law book, and that's also in a uh, in a form of the language that's closer to how people are speaking than the standard uh, classical Armenian is. And so, medicine and law books start to be written in this period, and they make use of Middle Armenian or this language that's closer to how people speak. Um. Remember, for the clerical writers, there's still this anxiety over using poetry. And remember this quote that maybe you'll remember, I, I brought it out in the very first lecture, Freak was one of the first writers to write poetry in Middle Armenian. Um, and he um, is saying here to his audience, Horjama Ganshtaneir Chadin Gam is pahir head gusano, avadaran bider le sel, gam zasaya gam bolosu. When you gave ear to evil or were enthralled by a gusan, you ought to have been listening to the gospel or Isaiah or Paul. And so for these clerical writers, their idea then becomes 
okay, we should um, use this form, these poetic forms, and even the vernacular language that's more approachable for people and put our Christian content into them so that people will be able to easily access the kind of message that we want them to get instead of viewing our text as, oh, too hard, or that's just for monks, and going to the gusans and other more popular things instead. Um, remember Nersa Shnodhali, this also is from last time, in the Kalathan to his Hisus Vorti, talked about how he was adopting um, the poetic genre in order to write this work. And that um, he was concerned that people might think, you know, what are you doing messing around with poetry? That's what Gusans do. And he addresses that by saying, no, even in the scriptures, there's poetry. There's the Psalms of David. There's the Song of Songs. And um, the same spirit that inspired those writers is inspiring me uh, to make this work that I'm doing. But this was still written in classical Armenian, uh, not in Middle Armenian. But Nersa Shnodali, as, as with so many other things we've seen so far, is a really critical uh, figure in this period because he's one of the first of these kind of like high clerical writers to adopt the vernacular and poetry in order to reach a wide audience. So we can see him as a very key uh, figure in this sort of transitional period where now even the monks are going to start using Middle Armenian uh, to write their poetry. And we have this amazing quote by Giragos Gonsaketsi, who was a, a 13th century historian, uh, writing about Nerses Norali, uh, some 200 years before, or 100 years before. And he says this, Zi ein bisi er ein gamk serpuin, zi te hanaritze, vot vok hositzi hosas ashkaraganas, paitzi krauts, vot jikinar pus, vot al hurahutunas. Was in einer Regel war er nach Jirkes, jev us suits einer Zig, wo Bahain es perten, zi pochanag weirapar, zainit sein asasten, wo er es gisne salmos in tafti. Hishetzi kisheri zanen koder. Yevai spes khor tapad askarki zartik park in, vor aizhamasi hegeretzi ijan kisherein bashtaman. Yevzi hamenaini hanjadere nerses, arar yevaragas khor tapadas, i krots yevhane lukas, zi pochanag aras beliats, zain asasen, i kinan pus, yevi harsanis. So he's, Yirago says, the desire of St. Nerses was to devise a means such, <clears throat> such that no one would recite vernacular material not drawn from the scriptures, whether at drinking parties or other festivities. So notice here, it's exactly when he's referring to drinking parties or other festivities, you should think gusans. You know, that's when they would come and perform. So he's like, I need to write something that people can use instead of these works by the Gusans. For this reason, he composed melodies himself and taught them to those guarding the fortress, so that instead of idle chatter, they would chant that one whose beginning is the Psalm of David, I recalled your name, O Lord, in the night, and solemnly each taking turns, awaken my glory, which now is chanted in church during the night office. So, as many of you know, Nersa Shnodali composed lots and lots of shadagans and yirks. And um, this one in particular refers to the, the yirk, it's called in the Jame Kutum, Hishatsuki Kisheri Zanun Koder. And then the second part of it, Zartik Pargim. Um, this is uh, part of the Kisherain Jam, the night, the night office that. Uh, many perform in the morning before Badarak on Sundays. Um, and 
Um, so you can see, first of all, his shotguns, he was trying to get people, the guards, you know, to sing instead of talking or telling jokes or whatever, you know, you do to pass the hours of the night when you're watching late into the night. Um, and then here, um, again, drinking parties and weddings, goosons. So he proposed proverbs and riddles derived from the scriptures. And the shadagans and the songs are in uh, classical Armenian, not so complicated, but classical Armenian. But these proverbs and riddles are in Middle Armenian. And um, it's, it's these that we'll spend a little bit of time with um, for the rest of this session, looking at uh, this great figure, Nersa Shnodali, uh, writing these very simple, um, you know, engaging texts in Middle Armenian in order to reach a wide audience with Christian content, we could say. Um, there's this nice book by Michael Pfeiffer called uh, Kindred Voices. Michael Pfeiffer's the new Armenian um, studies professor at the University of Michigan. Kindred Voices, a literary history of medieval Anatolia. And he compares um, basically 12th and 13th century uh, Turkish, Persian, and Armenian poets. And for the, for the Persian poets, one of the big figures is Rumi. Um, for his Armenian uh, ones, he looks at, it's mostly Nersa Shnodali and his riddles. Um, and then also Gostantin Yerzengatsi, who we're going to look at next time. And this is a really nice book, um, which just came out a year or two ago. And um, he translates this, this riddle by Nersa Shnodali um, as one of the examples in one of his chapters. So there goes, Pose me gair chis jardasan, ber ahakin zart khan karman, kuz mi gabiats vor bes gusan, kluch gudriats kert martasban. So Michael's English translation. There was a whore, sure in eloquence, and she was a hideous ornament of ruin. Binding a kettle drum like a troubadour, she severed a head like a murderer. Does anyone know who this could be? Remember, it's mostly drawn from the scriptures, so which character this might be? Salome. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> Ten points <laughs> for Matt Sarkisian. Yes, exactly. Salome, who is the um, daughter-in-law, right, of Herod, um, who had John the Baptist had uh, taken off uh, or requested it to be taken off. Uh, and and notice what do you notice about here that stands out? Um, any anything else? I mean, there's end rhyme in the whole thing. Absolutely, end rhyme. So it's poetry. Uh, what do you make of the reference to the gusan? It's very negative. Very negative, exactly. And remember the scene um, in the Bible. So um, Herod is at a party. He gets really drunk. Uh, Salome comes in. She does this amazing dance. And what does Herod say? He says, you know, he's so moved and impressed that he says, ask for anything you want up to half my kingdom. I'll give it to you. And um, she asks for John the Baptist's head on her mother's advice. Um, and so obviously for a Christian audience, um, it's this terrible, you know, seeing this terrible happening. Among Armenians, um, Surk Garabed is one of the most revered uh, saints and, and figures of the Armenian tradition. So it's all the more horrible. Um, and what Nersas is cleverly doing here is associating that, you know, horrible biblical event with the kind of parties that people go to in his time where they would also get drunk and listen to gusans at weddings or at other uh, drinking parties. And he's basically like, um, 
just kind of throwing Gusans under the bus and saying, you're just as bad as Salome or, you know, Herod who killed John the Baptist. You could kind of read that into the background here. Um, so that that's really interesting to see that kind of like direct competition uh, coming out, which we heard Giragos talk about, and now we see it like in the text itself. Okay. Let's see if you can solve these riddles. <laughs> so first on the left, Magig havug mi gair pokrig, vi kluch nu ner savug teprig, yer tair nester inken lerig, avot kanar arner chist sabergig. There was a small solitary chick, on whose head was a black feather. He would go off and sit silently to offer pure and holy prayer. So these are my translations. The rest of these. Um, First, while you're thinking about what this could be, I want to point out, you remember when we looked at the fragment, the Bahak needs an unta, the birth of Bahakan, how we noticed that one of the features of like uh, that that poetry back then, which was close to the way, closer to the way people spoke, was the use of the diminutive eek all over the place. And here you can see it uh, in Nersa Shnodali's poetry, the end Rhyme here is ig, pokrig, tebrig, lirig, sabergig. These are all that diminutive ig, which makes it very, very colloquial. Also here, havug, savug. This is not a character from the Bible, but a figure. Any thoughts? It's basically like a figure of the church. So in the Armenian, the answer is apera, which is essentially a monk. So I think what he's thinking of is like the black feather, probably what he's thinking of is like the hood that monks wear, talking about it in an interesting way. Um, would go off and sit silently to offer pure prayer. That's all fine. Why might he be called a bird <laughs> or a chick? My, I'm not really sure. You know, you don't. It doesn't really give the answer. But what I was thinking was maybe how um, the heavenly sphere is associated. You know, with God, the sky, God, and so the monk is kind of almost like ascending up to the heavens like a bird by his way of life and um, by offering prayers. So maybe he's uh, in in picking which animal to, to use to depict the monk. He chooses a bird because birds fly in heaven just like monks are, you know, aspiring to heaven, maybe. Okay, let's look at this other one. Yer guho viv astatsan vochhar. Yur yank nein azad yachpair. Minen madaguner artar. Muswin yarev bidzakahar. So, first of all, I just want to say it's interesting. If you speak modern Armenian and you didn't know any classical Armenian, you would basically be able to read and understand this. It's very close. Um, there's some differences, of course, but it's very, very close to even the standard uh, modern Armenian today. So, two shepherds had their sheep. They were each of them free brothers or noble brothers, maybe. One of them made a just sacrifice and was beat to death by the other. And I heard someone else say too, uh, Cain and Abel. Exactly. So you can tell I was just opening up the riddle collection to the very beginning <laughs> and just choosing some of the first ones here. Um, 
Let's look at a couple others. Dun mi desi uspidog parads, usav haver ines tarads, sus adzein tsech itzerats, lesvav chosin panaganats. I saw a white house spread open, with black birds perched inside. They were laying all manner of eggs and speaking in rational tongues. Let's look at the other one, because actually the answer to these two is the same thing. Shnod halitz gair al yusag, vuner hazar karen espidag, irens ma kikner sevorag, uiren hoviven zed hereshtag. There was a tablet full of grace that held a thousand white lambs. Its hues were blackish, and it shepherd like an angel. This is an object. Noah's Ark? Why would you say Noah's Ark? the white house kind of thing with the birds inside that that's that's just what came with mine no particular reason yeah it's not noah's ark it's a general sort of object uh, not not like a specific one from the bible Like media, you had seen it. Is it? I don't know. I wouldn't want to see that because it says black birds perched, you know, inside. Yeah. If I it's, don't want to see that. Yeah, but it's not the, that. I don't know. What about the thousand white lambs? I would I would also not have been able to get this. <laughs> uh, Is it like but, something from the Old Testament? Not exactly. So the the answer, yeah, I don't even know how I would give like a clue for this, but the answer is Buck Kirk. Oh, yeah. Okay, never mind. I would have gotten yeah. that. <laughs> I, exactly. So once you know the answer, you can see. Okay. So I was going to say scriptorium somehow, but yeah, good. So you were really close, uh, Kavork. Um, so the thousand white lambs, because books, you know, the pagers are made of sheepskin, and some of the big, big, big books actually used hundreds of uh, skin of hundreds of sheep to make them. Um, Tablet full of grace, so it's kind of, you know, the scriptures, maybe thinking especially. Um, its hues were blackish. Hard to tell. Maybe like the the ink inside the paper, uh, the, the words on the page. And it's shepherd like an angel. Um, It's hard to know exactly what he meant. Maybe like the inspiration came from heaven or from something like that for the inspiration of the words. Um, so would it be more specific like the gospel? Yeah. I think this one especially like means the scriptures, not just like any old book, but the scriptures. This one may be just like a book. So the White House, so um, blackbirds perch inside, laying all manner of eggs and speaking in rational tongues. So meaning the those words on the page uh, can speak, you know, I don't know. <laughs> but, but you have all the birds in the manuscripts too, so. That's true. Okay, good point. Was was he was he called Shnora, Shnora Ali in his own time or it came later? 
he was. So actually, Shnodhali, um, it you know it fits him so well for for the reason it came to be known for in modern times, which is like he was so um, you know graceful, like both inspired in his writings and also in his um, gracious and his relationship with other ecclesiastical figures. But the title Shnodhali, um, Abraham Terion, I, I was reading something where he. He wrote about how that title was uh, conferred on graduates of a specific Mm -hmm. seminary, like a specific monastic school. When they achieved the highest rank of Vartabha, they were given this moniker, Shnorhali. Um, And other monastic schools at the time had their own monikers um, that they would give. But it really stuck with him, be, probably because of these other reasons that it fit. So, use of that word at the very beginning of the second riddle just coincidence, or something maybe to be read into? Maybe, maybe um, he probably was. Yeah, he definitely would already have had that title uh, at this time. Okay, last one. This is also an object. Dasi is manuk mi vord zananej, yevinuin oren meranej, het tagaluin tartsia harnej, vile keretzig zink tsutsanej. I saw a young child newly born who on the same day passed away. After being buried, he rose again and showed off his radiant beauty. Areva. Areva, ayo. Vord. I know then are cock and gasin. So the sun. Who on the same day that it rises, passes away, but on the next day is resurrected or um, born again, harnej. Yeah, exactly. So you can see these are really nice, super accessible texts, um, especially coming from the perspective of modern Armenian. They're some of the easiest. Uh, older texts to read because they're in a very straightforward language. Um, And coming up in future lectures, we're going to look at um, other specific writers in Middle Armenian who composed kind of shorter poems, like various lyric poems on love, on wisdom, didactic topics. We'll look at Gostantin Yerzengotzi, probably Nahabed Kuchag, um, and then also some of the later, like Ashuls, uh, Sayat Nova, uh, even, we'll probably end with him, uh, Mugardich Nagash, another one. And uh, so we'll have a lot of uh, nice texts to see in the coming weeks.